I do enjoy listening to you, Indian. Oh, uh, win that possession, and it's broken nicely to Gazola. 30 meters from goal, plays it to the edge of the area. Alexis Sanchez goes for goal and scores. That's a brilliant goal from Alexis Sanchez. He's been Arsenal's star man this season, and maybe now. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to God Damn It, Mike. Hey, how you doing? Yeah. <laughs> What's yeah. going on, man? You know? Do anything interesting last night? I did I not. Did. I did not. I uh, well, <laughs> if interesting, weeping into your pillow, <laughs> then yes. Yes, I, there was a little bit of that. I'm, I'm, the hotel I have now, I, I'm, I'm lucky enough to have a rather nice bed. Has four pillows. All of them were soaking wet by the time I woke up, and um, I'll leave it to you to figure out what fluid it was. But uh, I'll go with tears. So uh, it was that kind of night. It was that kind of night. Um, but before we go into that kind of night, let's uh, let's get a host question, which we haven't had for a while. Yeah, and we're gonna start um, off like a normal podcast. I know, right? So Arsenal clearly lacking a captain, Mike. In fact, since November twenty second of two thousand fourteen. Our official club captain hasn't started a match. That so, would be Mr. Per Mertesacker, right? And Arteta before him. Yeah, I don't, I don't even. I don't even know anymore. So, so if you could choose the captain going into next season, who would it be, and why? Oh, that's easy. I mean, Vlad Dragomir is my is the easiest choice. I mean, you can't, you can't. There's no one in the current. Roster in this current lineup that I think is 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 ready to step up. Um, so you have to just pick some random dude from the under twenty three team that I haven't even heard about scoring or assisting on a goal in the last six months since I said he was my favorite player. So yeah. I'll make him my captain. I, seriously, if you had to if you had to pick from this bunch, and I'm dead serious about like our captain next year may not be on our team right now. Um, if if you had to, I mean, the only person who's showing that he really wants it is Ox. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I I have a feeling I know what your answer is going to be, and frankly, I, I I didn't pick him just because I didn't want to copy your answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I think that's also a good choice. But I'll let you get to that in a second. But I mean, you know, Ox may be young. He may not even be you know reliable enough to be in the starting lineup all the time, which is the point of your entire question. But you know, he is quickly and intelligently positioning himself as the outlier in this group of, of players that, that just seem to have a, you know, some, something mentally wrong with them. That's if so he stays. He'd, he'd be my case. <laughs> yeah, that's if he stays. He might be the captain of Liverpool next year for all yeah. we know. Um, yeah, I think for me it's kind of twofold. So first and foremost, I think when you pick a captain, it has to be someone that has the leadership experience. And the only player that we have right now who's got the leadership experience at club and national level is Xhaka. Yep. Um, and so that obviously is, is my first choice. The second option that we have, and again, it's if he's an Arsenal player next season, if he stays healthy, and if he can break his way into, this, into the starting 11, it, it's a no-brainer. It would be Jack. Because um, I can guarantee you if Jack was playing in this team and we were having these issues – Shit would be hitting the fan. I mean, he's in, he's for, I mean, he is Arsenal through and through. And so I'm sure it hurts him as much as anyone that's watching these matches because he's an Arsenal supporter first and foremost. Um, but, I mean, has there ever been a situation where a player's gone on loan and then returned from loan to become the captain of the team? I mean, well, the problem, that with, would be... the problem with Jack is he can't even get into a Bournemouth side, and no. albeit they're playing well, but. You know, he's making outrageous demands with Arsenal, saying he wants guaranteed playing time and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, dude, you're not even playing at Bournemouth, so God knows what's going to happen with him. I mean, the only year. path I could see for Jack to become captain, um, and I'm not disputing that he would be a good club captain in the long run, would be to come back, earn his way into the starting lineup and play it while Koscielny remains captain for next year. And then the year after that, um, when Koscielny, you know, presumably, his, you know, he starts to age out of his more effective years anyway, uh, that's when he takes the armband. But, I mean, these are really, like, kind of slim to none type, of, pre- well, type the, of circumstances. The other option that you think when I, you know, and I present the whole, like, club and country, uh, the other person is Rambo. 
but Duke can't stay healthy to save his life. So again, we fall into the problem of a club captain that plays maybe 20, 25 times in a season. I think you need to have a consistent hairstyle as well, which rules out Bellerin as well. I mean, you, that's a you, you have to people have to know what to expect week in and week out. They can't be like a man bun and then the, and then the frosted tips and then the platinum. I mean, you have to have the same hair, I think, to be the captain. Well, he's sixty pounds away from looking like a fucking sumo wrestler. Um, but let's move on from that. So we play Crystal Palace away. You got to go to the match. We'll start off by just quickly discussing the fact that our bus was late. Um, I was so was funny that not a sign of things to come? Well, you know, I was listening to Talk Sport in the lead up, and they were they were saying how that would affect the Arsenal players, and Arsenal would start the game off flat. And I just thought, for for so called professionals, they obviously haven't been watching us play this season because we start every game off flat. Um, so late bus or not, yeah, it's not ideal. But these guys are professionals; they train, yeah. you know. Well, they should be. Within 18 hours of that bus getting there, they're they're ready to go. They don't need 20 minutes to get themselves warm. I mean, at the end of the day, Mike, they warm up, and then they go back into the locker room where they're cooled down again. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, we we were in the pub uh, just walking distance from the stadium, and you texted me that the bus was late, and and this was, you know, or that it had just gotten there. I think this was like a 2, or not 2, well, 7.15 local time. And, you know, I asked you if the game was going to be delayed, and you said no. Uh, and I said, you know, that, that's, that's going to affect us. It shouldn't, but it's just another excuse. Like, you know, we, after the games, we hear Wenger, and I'm not saying that Wenger blamed the performance last night on a late bus, because as far as I know, he didn't. <laughs> but it just seems to be, you know, in the past, he's talked about short rest between games, uh, fixture congestion, Referees, you know, all, it just always seems like there's an excuse, and it, it, I, it does that not get into the players' heads to where they're thinking, well, here's just another adversity that's being piled up upon us, and 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 how are we going to recover from that? No oh, shit, and then all of a sudden, before you know it, you're down one nil. I don't know if that's the case or not, but it shouldn't be. Mm-hmm. It shouldn't be. I mean, I, late buses have arrived before, and teams have rolled the opposition that they're better than. Um, you know, and, and, and that shouldn't, that shouldn't be an issue, but it certainly wasn't a good omen. It wasn't. Another not good omen is that Arsenal concede, um, again, off of weak defensive play. Here's my thing, Mike. Whenever Arsenal concede a goal and Gabriel's on the pitch, he is the, like, scapegoat to no end. I mean, people cannot for a minute blame Mustafi. And, I get that Gabriel is not the most consistent player. Uh, I think we joked on the last pod that he played really well last week against West Ham, so he was going to be shit this week. But yeah, he had he had three really good halves in, uh, in the first two games I saw, and and then and then not so much yesterday. But right. Mustafi's Mustafi's dire. He, so he, he's really bad. If we go back and 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 look at the goals, because I went back and watched them on replay, and Gabriel is to blame to with the start of the first goal, and here's why. He goes in for an initial header um, with, I believe, Bente- Benteke, but he kind of shies away from it, and Benteke wins the header, which pushes the ball forward. And as a central back, you want to go in and you want to manhandle the forward first and then clear the ball, right? So that was step one. Step two is that no one communicated with each other Organ- for organization back there, and in my didn't opinion, Bell- didn't Bellerin play the guy out on on side? That was unnecessarily. The, that not ne- no, because the the back four were in a pretty straight line. Um, Bellerin was a little bit deeper, but but before the header for Gabriel even happened, no one communicated. Let's push forward or let's drop back, right? No one communicated. You take ball, I'll take runner. There was no communication. If you go back and watch it, literally they. They don't even look at one another to see what's happening. My problem is if we had an out-and-out central defensive midfielder, that player would have stopped the play from even happening because they would have stepped the ball. Our defense are so concerned to drop into position, we do nothing else. So we have no one that attacks that first ball, and, and that's been the case all season. And therein lies the problem with the El Nini and Coughlin not having an out-and-out role of play deep defensive shield exactly we've all come to know shaka and i think he's been our best player the last five weeks as the ball goes through him 
before anyone else when it comes out of defense. He's always searching for it. But the first goal was just absolutely abysmal. Mustafi gets pushed off of the ball. Gabriel runs back after getting uh, fouled off of the header, and he's running into space to mark space. There's no man for him. But what the fuck Mustafi is doing, I don't know. And it highlights again the issue of what do our defenders do in training week after week? You got me. Because when you're going up against the likes of Sanchez, Ozil, Giroud, Welbeck, Theo, the Ox, you're going up against speed, you're going up against skill, you'd think our defenders would then be able to match that in the Premier League, right? Just makes sense. Yeah, if there's a plan and if there's somebody holding them accountable. but Yeah, yeah. But, um, I mean... Holy way, that's just a bad way to go. And always, always nice when an ex-Spud scores against you as well. Seriously, right? Seriously. And the second goal, again, just as poor as the first. It started with two players not fighting for a header. Uh, literally, a Palace player jumped up against two Arsenal players, and they looked at the ball, which then put the ball on... Uh, who scored the goal, was it? Uh, Kabaye. Kabaye. Puts the ball on his foot. He just chips it over the keeper. I mean, it's a beautiful shot, but it shouldn't have by happened. Who, by who we had no time for, not, no time for in our squad. <laughs> seriously. Yeah. Seriously. But again, it's a trend, it's like, man. We pass these guys over, and they and they score worldies against us. Yeah. It, again, I want to highlight Mustafi on the second goal. Instead of tracking the man, he just runs back into position where he thinks he's supposed to be. It's like he's zone marking the entire game. Right. And it's frustrating to see that because had he had he turned and 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 man marked the player, the shot wouldn't have happened. Or if the shot would have happened, it would have been a lot harder for the shot to have happened. And unfortunately, Martinez was in a bad position, but it was a great shot. You can't fault it. I mean, it was absolutely perfectly placed. Yeah. But yeah, spun right into the corner from kind of an off balance. I mean, it it, it was a good goal. Yeah, well, by that point, it kind of felt like it was it was over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, th- I, I when you look at when you look at the the first half first half performance, it took a while for Sanchez to wake up. I felt Ozil was pretty non-existent, but Theo Walcott, Jesus Christ, can we carry him any longer? I mean, he was fucking atrocious. He I mean, it just the whole first. Half, the, the whole first half just looked like a – I mean, when we had the ball, which was a fair considerable amount of the first half, it looked like one of those four corners drills that, uh, that, that, that the college basketball used to do before they put the shot clock in. I mean, it was just, it was just a, it, it was a clinic in just passing the ball around an arc about 35 to 40 mm-hmm. yards from goal. There was no incisiveness. There was no plan to, to, to go forward. I mean, I – I have not looked at the statistics because I, you know, I've, I've just been been out and about. But uh, I mean, the number of sideways and backwards passes in this game has to be even higher than the already high normal that it is because there was just no pushing forward in this game. No, and every we time had, they did, they turned the ball over. Yeah, we had no movement. You're right. It's like we would get to the opposition 18, and then we'd have to force our way back. And that just goes to show the lack of in, uh, enthusiasm and intelligence from Wellback and Theo. Because you can't really fault Sanchez there because he does make a lot of penetrating runs. He'll drop deep to get the ball. So that leaves the left open a little bit. Um, but Sanchez isn't all – he doesn't lack blame either because there was a lot of times he dribbled into space and lost possession or made a bad pass. But you're right. There was a lot of sideways and backwards passing. And, and we're used to that watching Arsenal, but we're also used to seeing those penetrating runs come through. I mean, it looked like they were just – trying to all get into a room and they didn't have the key. I mean, they, they're just, they're, they're continually trying to figure out how to, how to get through the cracks and, uh, and they were locked out for most of the game. Mm-hmm. I mean, no. <sighs> it's, it's the thing that sucks, Mike, is we keep seeing it week after week. It's the same thing. And there's no, there's no tactical change. You know, there's no, there's no different formation. There's no different setup. And I think that, that's the frustrating part. You know, if we went into a match where we tried something different and we lost, I think the, the, the fans would ultimately be pissed, but they would, it's, they would say at least we're not banging our heads against the wall watching the same thing week after week. Yeah, I mean, you the, reason that, we, the <laughs> reason that we rolled over West Ham in the second half is because we scored before they did. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, 
that forces a change in the other team's strategy on defense, which you know then we're either going to capitulate to and, and throw it away, or we're going to you know we're just going to be able to take advantage of it against a team as dire as West Ham. We were able to take advantage of it. Unfortunately, oh, you're lucky, by the way. The, the the bell's still in the suitcase, so there will be no bell today. I was looking for it after I said Dyer, and then, uh, but um, you know, we they West Ham had to start gambling a little bit, and we were just able to put it to them. Crystal Palace pulled off their their uh, their Sam Allardyce plan to a T. Um, we never broke through, and they never had to come off of their game plan. Right, right. Uh, yeah. Anything else from the match itself? Because there's a lot of interesting uh, stuff going on. Yeah, not, not really. I just, you know, for me, the takeaway was we should have put the ox on a little bit earlier for Theo. Um, Martinez played a good game. He had the one mistake, which led to the penalty. But by all accounts, the game was over at that point. And he was going after. And he was going. I mean, early in the game, he went after his defenders for some confusion and, yeah. and lack of communication. And, and I don't know if if that was shown on television or not, but it was right in front of us, and, and it was nice to see that. As a 24-year-old, um, it's great to see because you can yeah. tell he's got the balls to do it. I um, mean, you know, if the defenders look at him and say, who the fuck are you telling us what to do, then that's a big problem. But I, I, I give him credit for for coming out and doing it. I mean, he, he was left literally just on an island on a couple of plays before the breakthrough for Palo. Us and, um, and and he was he was not ha- not happy about it and, and showed it so I, I was happy to see that. I uh, you know. I, I thought I thought our best player on the pitch was Nacho. Um, he played a really really good game. He was pretty solid. I know some of the goals came down his side, but from a pos- positioning standpoint, best player um, or least worst player. <laughs> well, probably, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm gonna say best player because I think that he should get some credit there. Um, so th- for me that. The game is done and dusted. We go to the post-match, and here's my problem, Mike. You know, what I love about Theo is he's a PR god, right? I mean, we joked uh, uh, one of our earliest pods. He's been coached. He's been coached well. He could retire and become a PR director, a director of public relations and do very well. But I'm pissed off, right? Because he starts his interview with, we let the fans down, first quote. Very accurate. He apologized, and that's what a captain should say after the game. But then he finishes with, they wanted it more. You could sense that from kickoff. What the actual fuck? You sense it from kickoff? If you sense it from kickoff, Theo, and you're the captain, start barking orders at your team. Get shit together. But you can't come out here and say, oh, they wanted it more than us. You could sense that from kickoff. You're fucking on 140,000 pounds a week. You're not even worth a pound. So fucking eat a dick. Shut your goddamn mouth. Apologize. Say we're sorry to the fans. We played like crap and you walk away. There's no reason for you to turn around and go, Palace wanted it more than us. Then what the fuck are we doing in that locker room? What is the, the, love, affa- the love affair with you and Theo is over. You're, we're, we're right back to where we started. Now, I mean, but I, With a comment like that. I mean, you know, I, I watched the players. I took video and photos of players. I mean, as, as you could plainly see, I had my phone out pretty much the entire game. We'll go into that later. But, um, but the, uh, I mean, the attitude from the start looked like they were a team that was ready to build off of Wednesday night. And, and you know, I mean, I didn't sense any feeling that they were intimidated, which is kind of what that statement almost tells me. I mean, it almost sounds like, they said that they, I mean, they didn't, he didn't use the word intimidated, but if, if that team in whatever place they are, 16th, 17th place, was clearly wanting it more than they were and it was sensible, it, it was sensed by that, by the captain of our team, then that's intimidation to me. And mm-hmm. how are we being intimidated by those guys? Don't know. I, I, I have no idea. And, and, <laughs> You know, you'd think with a, with a squad like ours, with international players, you know, one win against West Ham doesn't inflate their egos and inflate their heads and they think, oh, we're going to roll over Palace, especially since Palace just did a number on Chelsea as well. So you'd think the, the management and the coaching staff and some of the senior players would say, hey, we need to get a run of, a run of games together. Um, Arsenal, or Arson, after the after the match... Again, doesn't apologize. Again, very vague. 
but but comments that it's not the right time to talk about him. Um, well, it's not convenient. Not convenient. And then he also says that things need to change, and he owes it to us to make changes. It's like, no, you're just telling us what we want to hear. Because if you were planning to make change, you would have done that four weeks ago when we started losing. And the body language. I mean, I, I, I haven't seen in- – I haven't spent a lot of time watching it, but uh, I mean, what was the body language? I mean, was it he just defeatist? Was, or yeah, no, he's defeated. Eye rolling or like? No, it's def- <laughs> it's defeated. Uh, there was a little bit of uh, a question where the the sky guy asked for a little bit more detail and information, and that's where Arson gave the whole like, "I've already told you what I'm going to say," and um, you know, I. I don't know, man. He looks defeated. I just don't know why he would want to continue doing this. Because, because he doesn't, I mean, I know why he would. Well, it's because he has no, he has no idea what else he would do. Well, he has. Eight I, but I don't know why a, a normal person would would want to continue to do this. No. Other other than eight and a half million reasons why a person would want right. to continue to do this, but. And and so and so let's go there because he walked out of that press conference and walked outside of the stadium and was getting hurled abuse from a couple hundred fans at the at the team bus, rightly or wrongly. It's getting to a point where the club has to now recognize these protests are a real deal, right? I mean, come on. It's yeah. getting out of control. I mean, it's, we're a laughing stock. Now, that, that, the, the bus situation, I didn't see. Um, I, I've seen clips on Twitter and stuff of it, and you know, it's very reminiscent of the Stoke train station a few years ago. Um, <laughs> and, you know, get out while you still can, Joel. Um, but, um, that I didn't see, but, you know, the, the rest of the, the, the fan protesting and all that, I could, I could certainly go into pretty good depth on cause, cause I was right in the middle of it, not participating in it, I must say, but not, but, but in the middle of it, documenting it and kind of just head spinning. But, um, are we ready to go into that a little bit? Cause I mean, I, yeah, it, the, the, I have to say, first of all, that you know, going to an away game. I've, this is my third one, if you don't count, you know, back when I was a teenager, away games. But uh, this is the third one I've gone to in the last few years, uh, and they've all been very different. One of them was was Olympiacos away in the in that Champions League game, and I mean that was intense and amazing and 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 wonderful because of how the game turned out. Um, one of them was Villa away the following week, and it was just kind of lame because Villa is, is just so big and the away section was large, and Villa was dead to rights anyway. So this game was, you know, a London derby, uh, a hard place to get tickets for. Um, was lucky enough to have a friend, Jeff uh, Lancaster, who got amazing tickets in the third row, uh, so we were super close to the action. The fans were brilliant from the beginning. I mean, in the in the hallway, in the in the corridors, chanting Arsene Wenger songs, chanting all of the players' own songs. Danny Welbeck, Alexis Sanchez. It was a festival. And from what I understand, for the most part, the away travel support is that way. Mm-hmm. Dancing the whole time, standing the whole time. No one sat down, and 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 it started off that way in this game uh, as well. And. Um, didn't necessarily stay that way. I mean, by halftime, the, the, the unrest started to grow, and people were starting to grumble. You go to halftime down 1-0 without having really shown a lot, and, you know, but there's still another half left. By the time the second goal went in, it, it just downright just turned toxic. Um, I've never seen such a turn in that. And, and you know, from what I understand from people who were there, when we lost to Manchester United 8-2 at Old Trafford in that game, uh, the away support started singing, never stop singing supportive songs um, and and you know it, it was almost just like fuck you fate of what's happening to us right now we're going to still support the club uh, and you know and that was in stark contrast to what happened last night um, so the beller and throw in thing i mean was was absolutely nuts the ball goes out lands 5 to 10 feet from where i'm sitting um, and you can hear as the ball is coming out, you can hear people saying, don't give it back. Don't give it back. And, and so I pull out my phone. I start taking video. And the video is, is I posted it on Twitter. And I, I have never had a video like that go viral where, where t- you know, 2,000 people have retweeted it. And newspapers have picked up on it. I, I, I feel bad that the video I took has contributed to that kind of sens- you know, sensationalism because the way it's being used is mostly just to kind of – 
just make a huge deal out of how toxic the situation is. But it's what ha- happened. I mean, it was what was happening right there. So, so they're holding on to the ball for a lot longer than you're supposed to hold on to the ball uh, when it goes out. Bellerin's standing there kind of waving his arms, just like made, being made to look like a fool. And, and meanwhile, everybody starts chanting, um, you know, you don't deserve to wear the shirt. Uh, um, or uh, I'm, I'm spacing now on what the actual words are. I've been, I've been hearing it all day. But, um, and, and it wasn't directed just at Bellerin, like a lot of people are saying. Uh, they're making it seem like it was an individual chant aimed her- directly at Hector Bellerin. It wasn't. It's just that Hector Bellerin was standing on the sideline facing the crowd asking for the ball back. And, um, you know, it, it, it's just, it's crazy. I, I, I don't know how to feel about it. Because, I mean, what these men and women do, the traveling fans, the, the regular away supporters, I mean, these weren't like new tourist fans, young fans. These weren't specifically and exclusively like the the people that are being called so-called fans and and I'll say it I mean these aren't the people that 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 are being accused of being you know Arsenal fan TV uh hooligan type people who are just out there to spout shit even though I don't agree with that that whole concept um I mean the demographics of the people who are being abusive did skew younger but there were there were people in their 40s and their 50s and their 60s who were chanting the same thing and and it's just you know, for that segment of fans to get that angry, to shout that kind of abuse at a player or a group of players, things have gotten really bad, Andy. Now, yeah. What, what do you th- What do you think? About, I mean, like, like, where do you fall on on? Is it appropriate? But is it a hard pill to swallow? But 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 it's their right to do it, or do you think it was just disgusting and vile, and and has no place in football, no matter what's going on? I mean, or or somewhere in between. I I agree with you that I I believe it to be more or less to the collective team, not just Bellerin. He just happened to be the closest player at the time. Or at that oh, that's not, a, that's not an opinion. That's a fact. Yeah. I because mean, they right. they, it happened other times, and, and, and it, was shot, it was aimed at other people, uh, basically, you know, whoever came to that corner. So it was mostly the right-sided players, Chambo. Um, you know, I don't think it was, it was directed specifically at Chambo, but, I mean, just anybody who, who came to that side – it was aimed at and hurled at. So, I mean, it wasn't just about Bellerin. I can tell you that for sure. Yeah. The, the fans that travel away pay a lot of money. And I know a lot of people that don't go to the Emirates for home games. They just use their season ticket allotment for away tickets. Uh, and so... You get the credits. It, absolutely. Um, and the credits for, for Palace, for a game like that, you have to have a lot of credit. So it's not, you know, it's not, or, or know somebody like I did. Yeah. Uh, but it's not, you know, these aren't casual fans that only go to a couple of away games. No. Now, to answer your question before uh, you go off on another 25-minute tyrant again, Mike, um, <laughs> you asked if I thought it was appropriate. You know, at the end of the day, no, it's not appropriate. 50% of me believes, and the other 50% says it is appropriate. Here's the deal. If we go down to Palace and we're losing 3 nothing, but 11 men are busting their asses to play for our club, to play for the shirt, then, then no one's going to yell that, right? But when you watch your team play that shitty and you pay the money and your expectation, because we are the Arsenal, right? I hate the whole expectation of we should be guaranteed Champions League, we should be guaranteed a trophy every season. That doesn't happen. It's sports. But one thing that you should be guaranteed is that the players play for the shirt and they give everything they've got, okay? If we had 11 players giving 100% for the entire match, they wouldn't be singing that, right? No, I mean, we, it's, we would it's, be it's based on effort. Absolutely. And so at 2 nothing, we gave up. We absolutely gave up. And that is why the song started to be sung. And it's warranted because of the performance on the pitch. Right to hurl abuse at the players and the manager after the match by the bus, probably not the best idea. You know, Theo came out and said, "Hey, we we understand, we apologize." The players know that, right? And a lot of this game is mental, and you want the support of your fans. But herein lies the the bigger issue: is why is the board and the manager not commenting on this? Right? We keep hearing the same old bullshit of, I'm not going to discuss my future, blah, blah, blah. If you tell us you're staying, it's going to be meltdown. If you tell us you're leaving, there'll be 100% support over a manager who's transformed the club. 
So there is where I have an issue, and there's where I feel like that is the big underlying topic is we can scream at the at the players all we want. They are pay a lot of money to perform for us, and they are not performing. Okay? If I come to my job and I do really shitty, I get written up, I'll get in trouble, I'll get fired, right? These guys don't have a fire lit under their asses from the management team, so the fans are the ones that have to do that. And yeah, so I, mean, I feel so, like yeah. the I feel like the song and the abuse maybe is a little bit too much, but you showed a video last week of it happening at QPR. Or one of the matches. No, you no it was happening uh, with uh, Ipswich, oh, with uh, Ipswich, the away yeah. fans at Fulham. So, yeah. so it happens everywhere. We're just the Arsenal, and it gets a little bit uh, gets a little bit higher profile. But at the end of the day, Mike, you know, we saw a tweet today from one of your good friends that if you're going to run Arsenal as a business, then yep. the consumer is always right. And we right now are the consumer for this product that we are buying into, that we have purchased. And so you have to deal with it. And it, what bothers me is that Kroenke, that Ivan, that Arson can't come out after the match and apologize. They can't say, hey, I'm sorry for this. It's not appropriate. It's not good enough. You expect more. You expect better. And so the abuse being hurled, I'm, I sit on the fence with it. But again, Mike, these people are paying for tickets. You paid money. I know you weren't one of the people singing. But those people pay a lot of money to see the team, and if they're not performing, then that's on them, right? It's on the players, and the fault lies only with the players. And I'm, I'm getting sick of the rhetoric of uh, Kroenke out. He's the problem. He is the problem, Mike, but he's not going to leave. Right, no, so there's we no need benefit. To to... The, we need to focus on what the problem is, and, and, and everyone's saying that it's, it's 100% Arson's fault and not the players, or it's all the players and not Arson's. It's bullshit. The fault lames, uh, lies 100% on all of them, on all of them. Yeah. And it, it, it's, it's a virus that's just it's, – it's progressed. It's metastasized so far at this point that there is no one way to treat it. I mean it, it, I, I don't want to use the, the C word, but I mean it's, it's – and I'm not saying cunt. Um, <laughs> I don't want to use the C word, but I mean it literally it, – it, it, you know, when you, when you catch an illness or a virus early – you can hone in on the on the cause of it, and you can put all of your efforts into fixing it. But when you wait and you let it fester and you let it metastasize as it has, you can't find the single source and the single solution. And 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 that's the that's the desperate thing about this is is that replace Wenger, we're still going to have systemic problems that are going to cause us difficulty over the next few years. The the uh, the wrong strategies and, and the wrong management, the wrong owner. If the owner stole the team, God, who knows what kind of new illnesses we could end up getting. Uh, it, probably not as bad as the ones we have now, but I mean, there's, there's just no, it, it's, it's gotten to the point where there's no, there's no single fix. So any fix, any attempt at fixing it, I think would be better than nothing at this point. Mike, you know how I feel about Kroenke. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm in no way defending the man. But the beginning of the season in the summer when we were in California, the highlighted issue was we need a um, – holy shit, Juventus are now 2-0 up on Barca. Uh, we highlighted that we need a center back. We need – Max Allegri. I know, right? We need – Because he'll just come here right after this game. <laughs> we need a center back. We needed a central midfielder that was a little bit more aggressive, ball-winning central midfielder, and we needed a striker. Okay. To his credit, Kroenke supplied those funds because we spent 98 million pounds. Right? Mustafi's playing every match. Started off really well. Not playing too hot. For a player that's making as many mistakes as he is, the biggest slap in the face that he could get is, hey man, you're not in the starting 11 today. Rob Holding is. And Rob Holding may be young, but he probably will do as shitty or better that Mustafi's doing right now, right? So it's really not – it's not about putting a weaker player in. It's where do the mistakes happen, okay? You're going to tell me that Rob Holden couldn't start against Middlesbrough and give you as much confidence at the beginning? Than, I mean, at this point – If anything, he will do better because he's trying to prove a point, right? Yep. So you have Xhaka who, to his credit, is growing into our team, growing into this league and doing very well. 
And then you buy the striker, Perez. And he's just not playing. And maybe he's injured, but he hasn't played as an out-and-out striker. And when he does play up there, he does very well. So therein lies the fault, again, on the manager. We put in, Kroenke put in the budget, here, go buy these players, and Arsenal went and bought him, right? I was thinking about it today. Our season, Mike, started down this, like, negative path with Jamie Vardy. We couldn't fucking sign Jamie Vardy. Right. And therein lies, like, we had one option, we had one plan, and there was no plan B. So the fault there lies on the manager yet again. So I'm kind of sick of the whole, like, we kind of Yeah, we kind of lost out. Like, is that because of Vardy? If yeah, we no, ever I, really had a chance at him. Right. But it's just like, it's just like, Kroenke's going to stay. Kroenke will support the next manager that comes in. He's shown that he's going to give money. So the problem then lies at Ivan and Arson. And Mems put on Twitter today that he had heard from a pretty good source that Ivan tried to walk away three weeks ago and his his reg- resignation was denied, right? Wow. So who <laughs> denies that? Is that Kroenke that's doing it? Is it Arson that says no? Is it Kroenke that says, stay until the end of the season because I'm going to let a bunch of people go and we're going to have change all over? I don't know. But we've got to stop with the whole Venga who did, he, who did he hand his resignation to? Because we know exactly. who hired him. Right. But we, we, Arsene Wenger hired. <laughs> yeah. But we need to stop the whole Wenger out. We know we want him out. Right? The, the, the time for a change is here. But we got to start focusing on the bigger issue. And I'm sorry, Mike, but kind of went on a long time. The issue is with the 11 players that are on the pitch not fighting enough for the shirt that they're wearing. Right? Whether or not you agree with the manager's tactics or you don't. He's not going to get off the bench, and he's not going to he's not going to scream at you. But there needs to be someone on that pitch, or two people on that pitch outside of Sanchez, who are sick and tired of looking like absolute bellends each week. I mean, I'd be embarrassed if I was Oxley Chamberlain. Yeah. Actually, that's a bad well, example you, because he because he can, he, he can see that he's embarrassed. I, mean, I would be embarrassed if I was Theo Walcott. I would, I would, I would be embarrassed as a professional footballer because because Theo is the best example out of all of these players. He plays like shit, even though he scored a couple goals recently. He's still a shit player, and then he doesn't make it into the England squad, and he gets super upset about that. Gareth Southgate has a pair of balls on him because he's one of the England managers who says, "I'm not going to pick you just because you're playing for Arsenal, Liverpool, United. You have to show me on the pitch you deserve to play." And he's not showing anyone he deserves to play. And so if I'm Theo, I turn around and I bust my fucking ass to prove to everyone, including Gareth Southgate, I can, I can make a change. Just because you score goals against Lincoln, just because you score goals against Sutton and you get lucky against City, fuck off, man. Fuck off. You are not fit enough or good enough to wear the fucking Arsenal shirt crest on your, on your chest. And I'm sick of it. The next manager who comes in, I guarantee you, Mike, gives him one season and says, Theo... You've had a decent season this year, but if you don't replicate, you're fucking gone. Because you're a cunt. Useless I hope cunt. So. Oh, man. God damn it. <laughs> well, I mean, you, you mentioned the something I was going to mention, which was the tweet from Drew Thompson, uh, who, who, who found this elsewhere. These aren't his words, but, but, but he brought it to my attention about running the club like a business. Um, you know, when you run the club like a club... Uh, and I know sports is business these days. It's hard to separate them. But when you run it like a club uh, and you incorporate your fans and you do like Dortmund does um, and take measures to make the experience better for everybody, home and abroad, then, you know, then, then great. You should be able to expect and receive unconditional support in good times and bad. Um, but when you, don't, when you don't say a word about David Rocastle in your game day program, on the weekend of his death, which you know is coming, when you when you charge the ticket prices that we charge, when the stadiums run like you know like like you're in North Korea and you're privileged to have a seat in the stadium that you paid out of your ass for, uh, you know when business decisions are being made at, instead of competition decisions about profits, and when regular supporters that come there week in and week out are treated like sheep, yet foreign supporters, and I'm in this class, uh, when they go on tour, are treated like VIPs and get special once-in-a-lifetime experiences and opportunities that the regular fans can only dream of because the, tra- the, the, the supporters there are new markets and new, op- new opportunities to, spend to, to make money. 
you should expect that there are going to be some negative uh, feelings that come to the surface, and, and that's where the, the, the quote is right. I mean, the customer is not always right, but the customer should be listened to and not just completely mocked. And when it, and when it doesn't happen, you're going to get the kind of anger and, and, and absolute hostility that you saw last night. And it continued after the game. Um, I was very interested in seeing who – was going to come over, if anybody. I knew Chambo would come over to clap the fans, and he did, and the fans clapped him back. But then it got kind of ugly. Uh, Hector Bellerin came over. Well, actually, he wasn't the first. Alexis Sanchez comes over and walks about halfway over. The, the claps turn to booze. He stretches his arms out like, like you're kidding me? This is, what, this is what we're getting? And then he waves. And our, our friend Ola... Uh, had had said that wave kind of looked like a wave goodbye, and I was like, "You're you're looking way too deep into this. That's that's silly." Then I look back at the tape and I watch it over and over again, and it's a progression of, "I'm sorry, what the fuck, fuck off." You know, like it went from one to the other, and he just waves and turns away, and turns and walks away, and it, it just it. And then Bellerin comes over and gets absolutely roasted, and. Ox has to console him as they walk back. I mean, it's now you know why they don't come over. I mean, they, they, it's almost like come over and take your beating. But you are you are an employee of the fans. They are paying you to be at the club, and so your job is to go over and clap them, win or lose. Boo, I agree with that. Boo, I think it's pathetic that they do. Boot or not, you are uh, an employee of the fans. And at the end of the day, that's a vague statement and maybe a naive statement, but it's a true statement because without us, they're not there, right? But it goes back to the bigger issue, Mike. If fans for Arsenal were paying 500 pounds total for a season ticket and the performances were like they were, I don't think the fans would be as hostile, okay? Because we're paying premium to go to these matches. I mean, like you said, you and I, we... (laughs) We're the lucky few that get to go to England once or twice a year and take in three or four Arsenal matches, but it's not cheap. And no, but, no, but we're we, still... we have a guaranteed ticket when we go because Absolutely. of the because of the supporters' club. We have the uh, the occasional opportunity to go down to the concourse and have a photo op with one of the the players after the game. We're the ones that get to have a fan event in San Jose. I don't know if you live here, and, and you know if you live in Islington or, or, or Milton Keynes or wherever, and you and you you go to every single game, home and away. How many opportunities do you have to really feel like you're part of things? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, I will say this: you know, I'm watching the Juventus Barcelona match right now. Juventus are up two nil. They have a manager who obviously has motivated them enough to go out against Barcelona and compete. And Juventus are getting walked off the pitch in terms of possession, but tactically they are just on point, and they're making it count when they win the ball. And that's I think that's something that we've just missed for so long is is a manager um, who will make those changes. And so let's go, let's go into listener questions, Mike, because we've got one from Kerry McCollum. Who is asked, kidnapping Max Allegri an option, by the way? <laughs> yeah, he asked, "What does the team do to get back on track to play like?" to play with a fire like they used to. And I think the question there is the locker room needs to get one back by Arson. First and foremost, these are not... Oh, you think that's even... That's not possible. Exactly. These are not players that are playing on the pitch right now for the manager. They're not. They, They... Just seeing them and seeing the abuse hurled at him, you'd think that they would stand up and go, we've got to give everything. And they're not. So first and foremost, I think the manager needs to win back the locker room. Um, I think the the uh, the players need to show that they're going to fight for the shirt, 100%. Uh, I think that the players need to have Oxlade Chamberlain's type of passion because he's he's playing for a contract either with Arsenal or somewhere else, right? Um, he doesn't have the stature of Sanchez to say right. I can walk into any team I want. But if you're a manager, if you're Klopp, right, if you're Mourinho or somewhere else and you're looking at this kid play, you're thinking, the guy doesn't stop. Win or lose, the guy doesn't stop. And I want to see that from all the players. And in my mind, that's how this team gets back on track. Um, And then tactically, we need change and we need to bench some of these players. Yeah, I mean, I 
I would chalk up my answer to Carrie's question in the same line of what I was saying about the, you know, the metastasized situation. I mean, I, I just don't even know that you can get this team to play with the fire. I mean, the fire they used to. I don't know if we're talking about used to, you know, at the beginning of the season, used to in 2004, you know, when the used to is. But, like, I mean, we need to blow up the whole damn thing, I think. I mean, I, I just – I don't – I don't see a way back from where we are right now that's quick and 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 seamless. It's it's gonna be it's gonna be bad. I mean, we're, we're, I don't think we've seen. <laughs> I'm so positive right now. I don't think we've seen the, the the worst of it yet, and it's and it's early days. But I, I mean, to, there's there, there's no fix to me. But I think I'd take your suggestions as well as any. Well, Mike, if you look at our remaining um, remaining schedule, right? Um, we've got Burrow next week, Monday. Okay. And then we've got Sunderland or no, excuse me. We've got city in the FA cup. Yeah. The FA cup. That'll tell a lot about where this team is. Yeah. Then we've got Leicester who right now on a fucking tear. Then we've got Tottenham away. Then we've got Man United at home. Then we have Stoke and Everton. And it's just like you look at the remaining uh, fixtures for this club and you're almost looking at a loss to City, a loss to Tottenham, a loss to United. It's going to be a tough one against Leicester. Stoke is always a tough one. And then Everton are playing well. So you're looking at... Well, I will we, guarantee we don't beat Leicester City. We've got six matches remaining and we're probably going to lose three of those. I mean... Sixth place right there. If that... We could get overtaken by we could get overtaken by Everton. Everton. It could happen, yeah. We could get overtaken by Everton. Hmm. The, I think that you know. The, the I can't wait. That, I can't wait to get back to the states so is, someone will hold me. It, you know, the thing that sucks about this whole thing is if we were in a position to completely remove ourselves from European football, I would prefer that over Europa League. I would prefer to not have. That uh, that cup because there's too many games. I would just prefer that we just go in and uh, I don't know. I I agree, but 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 what my problem is when people start saying, "Oh, it worked for Liverpool three years ago, or whatever it was. It worked for well, it Chelsea because they never won the league, did they?" It's a different situation with us because I think what if we drop out of Europe altogether, and, and I'm not saying that Europa League has any kind of financial. Um, financial justification or, or awards that, that, that will help us. But I, if we drop to seventh place, I think that the, I think the expenditures will be cut to meet the revenues rather than you know investment in trying to make sure that we vault back into that place. I hope I'm wrong about that, but I do think the new reality will be adjusted to on the ledgers and – that's what makes it different than, than the Chelsea situation. From a, from a rest standpoint, from a focus standpoint, it would be nice to have just the best at competitions to be able to worry about while everyone else is playing on Tuesday and Wednesday a bunch of times. But I don't know how much that's going to help us if the players that we have to handle those are fewer and less talented because of the loss of those revenues costing, you know, cutting our payroll. Yeah. And that's why we're not the same as Chelsea and we're not the same as Liverpool. Yeah. Anyway, should we do pick-ems? Dude, the, the score is ridiculous right now. Uh, John Cross uh, didn't do it on the pod, but he, he did it off pod beforehand um, when we had him in, and nailed four out of five games, including two of them exactly right. So we now have Andy at 81. We have Mike which is me, for those of you that don't know, at 79, and the guest spot tied at 79 uh, as well. So uh, it's tight AF. It is tight right, as AF. What does AF stand for, Mike? As fuck, I believe. Mm-hmm. All right. Now I'm going to have to check the explicit box. All right, so we have Pickums. Uh, as you may recall, we had uh, the the pleasure of having Robbie from Arsenal Fan TV on with us last week, um, and we have him to help us do picks for this week. So, Robbie, thanks again for joining us. It's great to join you guys. 
the five games that we have for this week will be taking place um, on, I believe, the uh, 16th and 17th, uh, and the 18th, of course, for the Arsenal game. So yep. for, the first one is what we call our shit game of the week because it doesn't include <laughs> any, any of the quote-unquote top six teams, and that one's going to be Burnley at Everton. And I, am, I've been physically, contractually forced to go first so that I don't build my picks around Andy's. And now he's locking me out. But that's a long story. So I, and, and we'll, we'll, let, we'll give you some time to think about it, uh, Robbie. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to go, I tend to think Everton plays well at home. I'm going to go 3-1 to one to Everton. Andy. Mm. Yeah, I'll go 2-0 Everton since Burley cannot win away from home. Yeah, I, I I go three 0 Everton. I think Everton at home have been excellent this season. They they've hardly lost a game. I don't, I'm not sure if they're unbeaten at home or they have hardly lost a game at home. Yeah, we found that Burnley, out the hard way. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, they smashed us home, and uh, Burnley are terrible on the road. So yeah, I'll go three. And Lukaku will get a few goals in that game. Yeah, when, when we pulled a point back uh, in that crazy game with Burnley uh, many weeks ago. I believe that kept the streak alive of them not having taken a single, not a single win on the road the entire season. So yeah, I think they're poor on the road. So it's, it's crazy it's, that they might stay home, up. Home form. Well, when you're that good yeah, at well, home, they, they, they've been the opposite at home. They've been yeah. very strong at home. You know, they're tough nuts, tough nuts to crack at home, but on the road they're terrible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Next game, Man City at Southampton, a ground which I have visited within the past couple of weeks. Uh, very lovely place to watch a game. Uh, but it's not going to be lovely for, for uh, Southampton supporters on the day. It's going to be a 4-1 city victory, I hate to say. Ooh. I'm going to go two-all draw. Wow. Look at you. I know. You're, you're, you're from the south coast. Uh, Andy is coming out there. <laughs> I think uh, I think um, City unfortunately will win it two one, but I think it'll be a tough game because uh, City's defense is probably of all the top teams probably the only top team that's worse than their defense is worse than ours. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it's terrible. So they can see. Did, did I or did I not? So did I see Vincent Company prowling on the on the field again? Uh, in yeah, the last he's, he's, he's back. He's back he's to the still, he's, he's not fully fit or nothing. So. Their defense is terrible, so they'll concede, but uh, ultimately they've just got so much firepower that they will win the game, I think. And I'll go 2-1 to see. Okay. And uh, next game is Liverpool at West Brom, which I believe is, is the, a, a, a replay of the game last year where, where they went out and saluted the fans after barely tying 2-2. Uh, they did that <laughs> whole celebration thing. But um, uh, I don't know. I, this one kind of feels like a draw to me. Um, I'm going to go with a 1-1 draw. I agree with that. I'll go 1-1 draw as well. I think West Brom at home against the big teams, again, another very difficult team to play against. And Liverpool against small teams, they're useless. If it's the top six teams, they'll tear them up. But if they're playing teams down the bottom, they're terrible. That's bizarre. And, and Andy, because you didn't pick, you don't get a pick for that game. So. 1-0 Liverpool. <laughs> this is how I'm going to catch up to it. Okay. Uh, Chelsea at Man U. This is um, this is uh, this is the reverse fixture week to that uh, that Middlesbrough nil nil draw that we had in October. I remember uh, I remember that well. Um, mm. And 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 so on that on that weekend, uh, I think Jose Jose Mourinho got a a spanking at his old ground. This one's at uh, this one's at Old Trafford, uh, and he's going to get a spanking again. Uh, it's going to be two to one Chelsea. Yeah, I think Chelsea will win 3 0. Wow, at Old Trafford. Wow. Mkhitaryan will score th- three goals, <laughs> all offsides, and they'll finally get called. <laughs> and they'll finally get called back for once, because normally, normally all of United's goals that, that, that Andy predicts are offside goals that stand. <laughs> uh, okay, and Robbie? I, I, I think it's be a draw. I think, I think United at home, I think they're unbeaten at home. Yeah. This season, um, so they're very hard to beat at their ground. Is that zero I, win? I, 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 is that uh, two wins, twenty-five ties, and zero losses? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, they've just had so many draws there. So, but they, but Chelsea as well, 
you know, a draw will still be okay for them, you know, in their quest. So, uh, and Mourinho, I mean, what a lot of people are failing to see that he, he's, his record at the moment is worse than Van Gaal's, mm-hmm. and worse than Moyes. You know, he's, he's, I, I don't think it's the same Mourinho as what, you know, what they thought they were getting. The but I think you, yeah, I think it will be a draw. I, I, I'll, I'll go for a draw in that game. Score draw or nil nil? Score draw. Score draw. Uh, Marino will kind of park the bus because he's going to be so fearful one, one, of Chelsea. Two, what, are, what are you thinking? Um, one, one. Number. Okay, one, perfect. One, one, one. And last but not least, our second consecutive Monday night game, um, Arsenal at Middlesbrough. Um, Middlesbrough. <clears throat> Middlesbrough, sorry. Borough. Um, what am I, American? I know nothing about football. <laughs> soccer, sorry. Soccer. Um, <laughs> yeah, I... Uh, Obviously, it would be nice to have had the, the the pulling back the curtain a little bit. It would be nice to know what happened in the Palace game that's already happened by the time you're listening to this. But <laughs> I'm gonna say that kind of feels like a two-two. I hate, I hate to be pessimistic, but two-two. I'm gonna go four-nil Arsenal. I don't think Middlesbrough can score a goal to save their lives. Um, They've been pretty good lately. They have been, but they're they're in in return of that they have sacked their manager and then they just start leaking in goals. So I'm gonna go four nil Arsenal. Mm, I'll, I'll go three nil Arsenal. Uh, yeah, like you said, Monday night and you know Middlesbrough was one of the furthest grounds you can go to, and they put us away there on a Monday night and a bank yeah, holiday as well. It's yeah, a, it's a holiday over as well. So you know it's, everyone's moaning about that as Arsenal fans, but um, Middlesbrough. Not only can they not score goals, I think they're def- they they're getting relegated. I mean, they mm-hmm. they, they they just can't buy a win. Um, they started off fairly they, strong, and then they started off fairly a couple of big well, wins. But they they don't they don't win games. They don't score enough goals. They're going to be you know possibly that game against Arsenal will be the possibly the game that can see them go down. Yeah. Um. So for me, I can only see Arsenal winning that by three goals to nil. Arsenal. Excellent. Well, I guess uh, I might uh, might look a little pessimistic for that, but uh, I like to hedge my bets and be proven wrong in that situation. <laughs> so, well, Robbie, thank you again for joining us. Thank for you picks. very much. Thanks, Robbie. And, uh, and we'll get on with the rest of our pod. Well done. Um, we got a game next Monday. So we have a whole other weekend of no Arsenal football, which, uh, frankly, will come as a relief to me. And then Middlesbrough on Monday. So if you're an away supporter and you've just lived through the situation last night and if you want to go to the game next Monday, you've got to be going from London, presumably, or somewhere near London, to Middlesbrough. <laughs> did I do it right? You did. Yeah, middle, Middleborough, Middlesbrough, <laughs> former home of Jeremy Ali Adier. I was in an elevator with him once at Harrods. Yes, I, I've, I've noticed that from your from your Twitter profile. Yeah, the, it seems like still your proudest moment. Ah, uh, yeah, easily. Even with all of these podcasts that we've done, that's in still four like, weeks, still... I'm about to have my first child, and that still may be at the top of my my life moment. <laughs> Andy is in such <laughs> denial of what this, what's about to happen to him. It's not even funny. <laughs> he's, he's joining new fantasy hockey leagues. <laughs> And, and adult soccer leagues. I'm like, dude, your life is about to end in four weeks. You have no clue. Yeah, but to um, be fair, I'm doing that in tribute of my uncle who just passed. So it's really just yes, that really is. just for him. I wouldn't have done it otherwise. Yes. Well, that uh, the so, reasoning is good. I'm the reasoning is good. The logic of, yes. of thinking you're going to be active in it is not. It's the only way but, my wife let me do it. <laughs> I should say that. But would you... Would you want to be going to Middlesbrough on a Monday night for an 8 o'clock game that's not going to end until 10? And then, uh, I mean, I, shout out. By the way, i got to shout out to Ola again. I have mentioned him a couple times in this podcast, but he, he's a new friend of mine that, that I've met through, uh, through some friends. And he worked from 4 a.m. yesterday uh, until, like, 3 p.m. and then came to Selhurst Park. Got home probably one thirty in the morning, and then had to get to work at four o'clock in the morning again. So he's sleeping right now, I'm sure. Uh, but I mean, there's no way that a guy like that or most fans could go to Millsboro on on Monday night next week. So they, screw, I mean, the league screwed us in that sense. But God forbid we don't win that game and sh- or at least show up for it. Those fans are just going to be 
I mean, unless the fans are just, you know, Arsenal Middlesbrough, like supporters club, it, that's going to be brutal. Yeah. So we, I mean, we have to, we have to turn up for that game because that, that would be the hidden thing that if you're a fan in the United States and you're watching at three o'clock or, or, or at noon, if you're on the West Coast it's on impressive. your TV on a Monday, it, well, yes, it is, Commitment. but it, it's commitment, but it pales in comparison with what those people that are going to be at that game are going through. Yeah. And when that game is over, if it ends like it did last night, when that game is over and you turn off the television and you go back to work or you go back to sleep or you <laughs> go back to committing whatever crimes you committed, um, you know, you can, you can forget about that. The rest of the people have to get back from Middlesbrough, Middlesbrough to uh, to London and then deal with the following day with all of that frustration on top of it. So, God God willing, we come out and put in a, put in a shift in that game because there's a lot more to it than people realize. But um, do you think we have a shot to win at Middlesbrough, the team that's probably the worst team in the Premier League right now? I have uh, to ask. That yeah. I mean, we all, we have a shot to beat anyone in the world, Mike. We're the, we're the team that went from beating Bayern Munich and then losing to Sheffield uh, Wednesday in the same week. So we can beat anyone. Um, I think that playing Middlesbrough is probably coming at the right time um, because yeah. they can't school <laughs> they can't score to save their lives. But there's always a but. This team right now sucks mon- monkey ass. So I, I just don't know. It's it, It'll be an interesting game, and it's bullshit wow. of the FA to put that on a Monday night, especially on a bank holiday weekend, knowing that people are going to be going back to work on Tuesday. So I think we win. I don't. Yeah, think I mean, it's obviously you, you've, you've 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 picked them to win four 0 So I mean, yeah. it, you're, you've put you've put your money where your mouth is. I have. But... but at the end of the day, you know, as we saw against West Ham, and as Robbie said in our little special. Just because we win one match away is not going to change the vibe of this of this uh, this fan base right now, and um, I think there are probably a lot of fans after Crystal Palace who were planning to go up to Middlesbrough who have now decided not to. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised to see if our away section was a little lighter than normal. Yeah, I mean, and 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 that wouldn't be just a, simply a show of poor support. It would be a combination of multiple things, right. uh, not the least of which is getting screwed by the, the bank holiday on the Monday night game that yeah. far from home. So um, we have finally moved off of 69 countries um, listening to us. we got two more in the last couple of weeks since we last updated those. So we just want to say hello to country number 70, which is Ukraine. I'm told it's not the Ukraine. It's, it's just Ukraine. Okay. Um, and I'm going to say that Eduardo – had a, a listen when he was going back to visit some of his Shakhtar buddies because I was too lazy to to think about any potential Ukrainian Arsenal players because I, all I could think of was Shevchenko and he mm-hmm. never played for us. So, and then uh, where's the other where's the other country? Number seventy one is Belgium, which you know I would have thought Belgium would have been in the house a little bit sooner. I mean, yeah. Belgium is Belgium's you know kind of. Close to the UK a little bit, and um, and so now we know what Thomas Vermalen is doing with his free time, and we appreciate oh, it. Oh man, do we miss that guy? <laughs> we miss that guy three years before he left. Guy, we did, <laughs> but we miss him now, and we also miss. We have two former captains that wanted to come back to the club, Vermalen and Fabregas, and they were told no. And in hindsight, <laughs> it'd be great to have those two players back. Does Vermalen want to come back after he went to Barcelona? Yeah, yeah. He, really? he made some comments that he'd be interested in returning. And uh, Arson said no. Obviously, we moved on. But the, the, that one Just I po- I mean, but, but is, he, is he anything of a player anymore? I mean, is he healthy? Is he I, I playing someplace? I don't, I don't know. All I, know I made, is that I made some comments I'd be interested in returning. And, and, you know, I didn't expect to be taken seriously. Well, if you're looking at the grand scheme of life, Mike, um, it would have been <laughs> nice to have Fabregas back. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't think I can debate that at this point. Right. The only way I could debate that is if bringing him back took the money slot away from being able to sign Alexis, uh, which, given how we spent money that summer, uh, it very well may have. And then we never would have had Alexis for the last few years. But even that is starting to look like, what did that get us yeah. other than an F cup? So, but let's not go down that road again at the end of the podcast. Nope. All right, mate. Well, let's, uh, let's, let's wrap it up. And my last night in London, Andy. Oh, I'm sad. 
I've yeah. been here for for 18 days, and I'm off to Berlin tomorrow to to join my son, um, who's who's over there playing football. Um, lost in the Czech Republic today to a team of all stars, apparently. God but uh, damn it, Jake. Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna get over there. I'm gonna whip him into some shape, and then they're gonna they're gonna tear apart some uh, some Berlin some Berlin teams. And um, but uh, by the time we have our next chat, Andy, I will be back stateside again, um, and uh, I'll lose this British accent that I've obtained. Bye, Mike. <laughs> Come on, you Gooners. <laughs>